All right, our next speaker is a science writer, and she's written in a lot of magazines that I did not memorize, and I apologize. But she's awesome, and we're excited to have her here. Jennifer Watt. Is this thing on? People can hear me? Excellent, excellent. Um, I just want to take a moment before I start my own talk to give a shout out to Jessica Alquist. Um, <laughs> Uh, many of you aren't aware that in my own background, I grew up in an evangelical family and attended a Christian college at the height of the Reagan era. And the things that I went through at age 20 dwarf in comparison to what she went through at 15. And um, I did not have the benefit of a skeptic community. And she's very fortunate to have all of you. So I thank you as well. But now I'm going to talk about drugs. <laughs> I thought that would give everybody a rise. Um, I'm going to play a clip for you. This is a film from a movie called Flirting with Disaster. It was a Ben Stiller movie from 1995. Um, he essentially goes on this quest to find his real birth parents he's adopted. And when he does find them, he finds out that one of them is a, the father is a chemist. And the reason he was put up for adoption was because they were in prison for manufacturing LSD. This has become a way of life with them. They have another younger son who is very threatened by Ben Stiller doses his quail at dinner and then gives it to the undercover FBI agent by mistake. So I'm going to play that clip for you. Is this a musical table? It is a musical table. Oh, can oh. I get you something? I'm not feeling very well. What's, what Here, let me help what you. Is what, is what is it? What are you going through? Do you want to lie down? I don't know. Can what I get feel? you something, Paul? How do you feel? Vivid. Paul? What? Here. I'm okay. seeing colors that I don't want to see. Just go with it. Oh, That's why right. oh, I need to lie down. Wait, let me use this. Here, everything's moving. Paul, can you hear me? Oh. God damn it. Lonnie! Lonnie! Oh. Don't fly off the handle. Come in here. Come here. What did you do to Paul's quail? Nothing. Why? Come on. Don't give me that fake innocence. What did you do? Oh. I dosed Mel's dish. I meant it from hell and then he ate. Oh, my God. How much? I, two and a half tabs. Two and a half tabs? Are you crazy? Are you nuts? Doesn't your mother have enough to worry about tonight? Like why, this, do you have, now, why do you have to talk to me like that? Am I, it's am really I embarrassing to, to me, special? and I really don't appreciate it in front of him. I mean, who is he? What's wrong? You got the whole science thing going, and the next thing I, I know, you like him better than me because he's more like you than I am. I love you very much. Even if you were Jeffrey Dahmer, we would love you. Yeah, sure. Oh, you know, I'm not here to take your hand. Please, Where please. Where do you get this please. insecurity from? I don't understand it. This drives me Honey, nuts. Honey, Richard, you're real sad. All right, all right. Yo. I want you to apologize to Mel what? and to Paul right now. Come on, oh. come on. I'm sorry. You're sorry for what? I'm sorry that I put window pane in Mel's quail, and I'm sorry that you ate it. That felt really sincere, didn't it? <laughs> so this is clearly the perils of hallucinogens, or psychedelics, as they're often called. Um, LSD is by far the most famous. This is the mythology. Um, we've all heard the stories of the flashbacks and the panic and the anxiety and everything that happened to that poor FBI agent. He was the absolutely worst person to be given acid because he likes control and he likes reality and he likes all these things and S LSD messes with all of that. So, uh, and that was certainly my attitude towards acid. I mean, I was entertained by the stories, but I never really had any curiosity about it. And I kind of bought unthinkingly some of the things about it, that it was dangerous, that it was addictive, that you had flashbacks all the time and things like that. Um, I started working on a new book. Um, mostly I write about physics. My prior books are all about physics. But this one, I started thinking about the science of self. Um, all the things that go into making an individual human being, whether it's genetics or neuroscience or social psychology, um, and also just the way we construct identity, construct our sense of self. And I was sitting at a dinner with a friend of mine who was from this era, and was telling him that I was, ta I was doing this book, and he goes, oh, well, you have to try acid. And I went, okay, my people have been telling me that for years, and you know, they're usually very self-righteous and a little kooky and going on about consciousness and all this stuff, and I just don't buy it. He goes, oh, no, 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 that's not what this is about. You know, he says, what happens is it, you know, it like dissolves the self. It just dissolves the ego. He goes, and it, it can be tremendously freeing if you're the right sort of person, and I think you can handle it. Um, he says, I'm just warning you, though, when you come down, the self comes roaring back with a vengeance. And he goes, and you better like what you see. 
and so I just, now I had to try it, right? I mean, it's like, <laughs> you get a story like that. But first thing I did was to kind of research what it was I was going to be trying. And uh, LSD, many of you may or may not know, is actually a derivative of a fungus called ergot. Um, some historians think it might have played a role in the Salem witch trials. Um, many of the, the hallucinations and some of the oral hallucinations and things that were happening or were, that people claimed were happening um, on the witness stand, they think that it may have actually had something to do with that mass hysteria, or it may not have. It, there are actually some very interesting historical accounts from medieval France of you know, entire villages getting ergot poisoning and having these, these reactions. But Ergot does have a kinder, gentler side. I mean, it's not just this horrifying thing. It actually was used uh, as a way of stemming postpartum bleeding and as a headache remedy for migraines, which is why a company called Sandoz Chemical or Pharmaceuticals was very, very interested in the 1930s and 40s about looking at compounds, derivative compounds of Ergot. And this is Albert Hoffman in his lab uh, back in like 19, early 1940s, and he was playing around with these compounds. And he actually first isolated this one compound called LSD-25 about five or six years earlier, but it didn't really seem to have any uses that Sandoz found. They were really focusing on the postpartum bleeding and the migraines and things like that, and it didn't really seem to be anything of interest. But Albert Hoffman, a little bit, you know, genius is, is, is a little bit serendipity. He just kind of had this nagging sense that he might be onto something. So um, he did, in fact, go back to LSD-25, and he was working with a very, very tiny amount. I just want to give you a sense of how powerful this stuff was. It was literally like a hundredth of a microgram, and he got a little bit of it on his skin. And he ended up feeling feverish and hearing things, and weird colors were swimming in front of his vision. He had to go home sick. But he's a scientist, you know, there, there's a joke that says, you know, a normal person goes and like puts their finger in the socket and gets a shock and says, well, I guess I'm not gonna do that again. A scientist will go, I wonder if it does that every time. <laughs> so, yeah. Hoffman did that. He just said, I, I gotta try this, you know, I wanna see what happened. Clearly, some trace amount of this stuff got in, so I'm gonna be really careful. I'm gonna take maybe, oh, 150 micrograms, which is a lot, that's essentially, you know, a tab and a half, maybe two tabs. When you hear Lonnie saying that he dosed him with two and a half tabs, that is a lot. I know that FBI agent's a big guy, but he's gonna be up there for 10 to 12 hours. That is a lot of acid to hit somebody with. Um, so uh, Albert Hoffman takes 150 micrograms and just kind of waits. And, um, you know, and he started feeling slightly sick and feverish, um, but there was nothing wrong with him. He had no temperature. And then, you know, he really just started, you know, the, the world just started moving, and he would look at his hand and it would do weird things. And this is all contained in, in, in uh, his memoir, uh, which is called LSD, My Problem Child. Worth reading, it's very entertaining. And he got so incapacitated that his assistant had to give him a ride home on his bicycle, and, and that day, April 19th, 1943, has become known as Bicycle Day among certain enthusiasts, shall we say. Um, <laughs> But I loved his description because, you know, unlike a lot of people who drop acid, they're just, they, they, be, they become rather inarticulate. Hoffman was really able to talk about what he was seeing and hearing. He talked about these kaleidoscopic, fantastic images that they surged in and they opened and closed in circles and spirals and exploded in colored fountains. And when there was a sound, it would actually generate its own pattern. And, you know, so listening to music while on acid is a thing, and now you know why. <laughs> um, LSD needs a substrate. This is just a little bit of uh, science background. It's, it's one of the reasons that it, it gets uh, nicknames like window pane or sugar crew cubes or things like that is you have to put it on something. Um, sugar cubes right here is the most popular. And notice it's really just one little drop. I mean, that's how powerful this stuff is. Blotter paper, also very, also very popular. I love the blotter paper just because, you know, it, people have their inner artists. They get to actually, you know, you actually get to learn. Artists have trademark blotter papers, and it became this sort of like subculture art form. Um, the version of acid that we tried was in the Altide form. It was like, it tastes just like a breath mint. LSD is odorless, it's tasteless, it's in this little liquid, you can't taste it. And you think you're just taking a breath mint. You are not. <laughs> so this was, this right here is me trying to take notes um, while on acid, and I can tell you right now that um, 
I understood uh, Hoffman actually tried to take notes as well, and he ended up not being able to read his own writing and just giving up. I don't know how to explain it, so to say that your hand keeps melting into the paper. Um, <laughs> So, I would not so much say that it destroys the ego, because there was always an I. I was always aware of being an I. But what it does destroy, or what it does undo, is the construct, that self that you have constructed, um, that sense of identity, that sense of that you are here and everything else is over here. You just kind of, your molecules disperse, you know, with everything else. And so you're still you, but it takes a huge amount of effort to bring those molecules uh, uh, back down. Um, you know, I, it, uh, it took my husband like 40 minutes to make me a bagel because it just it required a lot of con concentration. <laughs> it was just way, and I didn't even notice because I was busy melding with the oriental rug. <laughs> so <laughs> um, at the end of this talk, I mean, we did try and videotape part of it, and all I can tell you is it's the most boring video footage ever because it's basically just me going. <laughs> Stuff is happening, you know, in your head, in your visual cortex, but, you know, to the outside world, it just looks ridiculous. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why that is, but this is kind of, you know, the gist of what I wrote. You know, I just kept going on about, you know, molecules, man, the boundaries, they fade the longer you stay in place, and every object is like this living and breathing thing, and we're all part of it. And then I had that moment of self-consciousness self, uh, and go, oh, God, I sound like every stoner ass it had ever. And I did. There is a reason for that. I'm going to skip this clip, but Mad Men actually very, very uh, famously did a scene where they were visiting Timothy Leary's New York apartment and they all dropped acid. And uh, it's, it's relevant because it's, it's a slow moving scene, not nearly as fast paced as the other, but you do see you know, a woman crawling around on the floor and you see them looking at each other's arms and things like that and getting the oral hallucinations. So, this is what acid actually does, and a lot of other hallucinogens as well. Um, this is a neuroscientist that I interviewed named Robin Car Carhart Harris. He goes, look, we have this feeling that we have always been who we are, and we don't realize that we are a construct. The way he put it was, you don't actually know you have an ego till you lose it. So it can feel as if there is a confusion about where we end and the world begins, as if we kind of merge with the world, or the oriental rug, or my like notepad. And that can be very upsetting. Um, I, I can't imagine what Hoffman was going through. He had no idea what was happening to him. As far as he was concerned, he could be dying, and he wouldn't know. Um, he felt great after everything wore off, so he figured it was good, it, you know, it was safe. Um, and he went back to his research. But while you're in the midst of it, if you are not aware that you have been dosed, it can, I, I can only imagine it would be terrifying. So. Early on, uh, Aldous Huxley is one of the more famous uh, pioneers of hallucinogens, and LSD in particular. He wrote The Doors of Perception. Um, he had an idea, you know, the, the idea here, there, there were some early theories about what is happening, how psychedelics work on the brain. Um, Huxley had this notion that LSD is like a reducing valve, or rather, um, it it uh, dismantles the reducing valve in our brain. I mean, this was this idea that part of the brain's job, we get all this sensory information in, and part of the brain's job is to shut stuff down so that you can function, so that you don't have the whole universe in front of you, but that you can deal with a, a limited amount of information. And the brain does that all the time. You know, it, it picks and chooses what it's going to focus on. LSD actually kind of cranks that way down and makes it far less effective, um, so that you end up really do have this experience of an expanding perception. Hoffman himself basically said that it's a biochemical effect, that it alters the brain's receivers, and it turns, tunes it to a different wavelength, which I think is actually a pretty good analogy for what's going on here. Um, one of the scientists I interviewed called it a chemical microscope. And when, he was, when I was talking to him, I was thinking of, you know, in astronomy, one of, the re, one of the ways in which we study the night sky is we look at it in different wavelengths of light. We'll look at it at gamma, in infrared, in visible light, um, in all these very different, ki you know, different kinds of wavelengths. And each time we look at it, we learn something new because we see it in a slightly different way. This is what acid does to the brain. Um, interestingly, and this is why Sandoz was, in, was intrigued by it, the chemical structure is very, very similar to serotonin, uh, which had just been discovered right around the same time. It's a neurotransmitter. Those of you who know how these things work with dopamine or serotonin or all these things, you have these neurotransmitters, and they, they are a key that fits into a lock known as a receptor. 
So the dopamine, dopamine uh, transmitters goes into the dopamine receptors, serotonin goes into the serotonin receptors. LSD is so similar to serotonin that it can attach itself to the receptors and it can therefore alter your brain chemistry in a really fundamental way. Um, turns out, according to a study last year by a UK neuroscientist, one of, one of them being Robin Carhart Harris, they basically put people on magic mushrooms into, a, into an fMRI. Um, this is your brain on magic mushrooms. Um, you can see, here's the placebo, you can see it all light up. That's your visual cortex right there. Those are the hallucinations. Good times. Um, <laughs> <laughs> The light show is extraordinary. I kind of felt sick and queasy the entire time, but it was worth it for, for like all of that. But what they found was that Hoffman, uh, Huxley was actually right. Um, it's literally mind expanding. There, and that in fact, brain activity decreases when you are under the influence of psychedelics. Um, that in fact, it, it is that reducing valve, as, as uh, Huxley called it, there really is something like that going on in the brain that really does seem to be the mechanism at work. So it literally becomes this mind expanding. So all that you know, new age you know, stuff that we heard that was all very mystical from Timothy Leary and company, um, they were crazy, but they weren't necessarily wrong. <laughs> um, there actually is some solid science to back this up. It's preliminary science. I want to be clear about that. We're st there's very much we do not know about the brain. And for reasons that I'll go into, it's extremely difficult to do these kinds of studies with these drugs because they're illegal. Um, so. Visual hallucinations are another interesting part of the science. I was fascinated by these because, um, first of all, you really understand where a lot of art comes from, <laughs> especially from the 60s. But in general, it does seem that human beings have an affinity for certain shapes. Um, they're called form constants, spirals, honeycombs, funnels, and cobwebs. Back in the 1920s, a man named Hans Kluver actually came up with these classifications that light at the end of the tunnel that people claim to see when they have near-death experiences, there's a reason for that, and that reason lies in the visual cortex. Um, the visual cortex is flat and two-dimensional, and because of that topology, there are certain shapes you know, that, that, that are dictated that must appear, and these are the ones that we are most commonly able to see. I don't want to go into too much detail about that. That's the general gist. Um, this man, Jack Cohen, at the University of Chicago, he's both a neuroscientist and a mathematician, and he's the one that has been working on this particular problem. It's related to work that Alan Turing did in uh, the 1950s, 1940s and 50s. You know, everybody knows the story of you know, Alan Turing, the homosexual who committed suicide. In, in, in the midst of all that turmoil in the last couple of, a couple of years of his life, he wrote this landmark paper on why tigers and, uh, have their stripes. Um, which is, and he called them Turing patterns. And essentially what he was proposing was that, you know, when the tiger is developing or whatever, there's these two, this is a, a two chemical system. And one turns, one turns on something and one turns something off and you get these alternating stripes. And you get these various Turing patterns. And uh, it turns out that neurons in the brain seem to work very, very similarly, that you seem to have these you know, similar things going on in the brain. I can tell you personally that I definitely saw that pattern and I definitely saw that pattern. Um, and you know, other people would have other patterns as well. So there's a reason that we see the things that we do. And they are not magical, they are not mystical, they're actually grounded in science, it does not make them any less cool. Um, <laughs> Uh, th this is actually a, a quote from, from my book in progress. As loopy as it sounds, LSD really does give you a new way of seeing, and what you are seeing is the synaptic architecture of the brain itself. This is why neuroscientists are so fascinated by the promise of hallucinogens in their research. It's very difficult for them to get permission to study it. Many of them would love to. Among other things, it might actually shed light on consciousness, which they are nowhere near casting any light on. So why can't they? Well, we have to go back to our old friend Timothy Leary and the culture wars of the late 60s and early 70s. Um, Leary was a Harvard professor who first started doing uh, experiments with acid at Harvard. Was, you know, he started working with magic mushrooms, then he turned to LSD. But he got a little too fond of his own drug. And uh, he basically had this, uh, this uh, motto, turn on, tune in, drop out, and it became this whole movement. He had huge delusions of grandeur. I think the acid helped with that. 
you feel big part of the universe, you feel like you were seeing things that no one has seen before, and he let it all go to his head. Um, he was, in fact, arrested. Richard Nixon went so far as to call him one of the most dangerous men in America. You had a huge culture clash going on with flower power, and at the same time, you also had a CIA experiment called MK Ultra that was overseen by Sidney Gottlieb that was basically administering acid to, you know, unwittingly to, sub, to, to people who didn't know they were being given it and then looking at what happened. And they tended to be prostitutes or prisoners or things like that, people whose rights were actually being violated by this. Acid got a very, very bad name. Um, and there were some very, very bad experiences that those people um, experienced. That's the peril of hallucinogens is that it's, they are predictably unpredictable, as, as once was one neuroscientist told me. You actually can't be entirely sure how you're going to react. We had a very, very pleasant experience. We were in a good place, and we set things up in such a way that, you know, there wouldn't be any angst. Um, but for someone who has, you know, some trauma in their past, for someone who, you know, is trying to, like, tamp something down or run away from it, unfortunately, acid is going to bring all that to the forefront, and it can be very, very uncomfortable. You can imagine that a prisoner or someone who's been abused or something like that, if they take something like this, it could be very upsetting. So in 1970, there was a huge you know, act, um, and, and Nixon, along, Nixon outlawed LSD along with other hallucinogens and many other drugs. Um, they were classified as something known as Schedule I, and the key element of that classification is that there are no medical benefits. That includes LSD, ecstasy, magic mushrooms, peyote, ayahuasca, and uh, ibogaine. Um, peyote and ayahuasca actually are used in religious ceremonies uh, in certain cultures, so there is a religious exemption in, within those sacraments where you're allowed to use those. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about those, but I want to focus on this notion that there are no medical benefits. Uh, in the last, about 25 years ago, they celebrated their 25-year anniversary last year, is this MAPS organization. It was founded in part by Rick Doblin. Um, they basically are trying to pick up the slack of what happened in 1970. All research in acid just shut down in 1970, and we haven't, for 40 years, nothing was done. And MAPS basically said, you know, we need to overcome the stigma, the social stigma that still lingers to these psychedelics from the culture war. As he put it, it's not the drug, it's how it's used that matters. And um, I just interviewed him a few weeks ago, and he just said, look, you know, our whole drug policy focuses on the drug as something evil. He goes, really, it's people's relationship to the drug that matters. Alcohol is a drug for an alcoholic, and a very, very bad one, but most people who are not alcoholics can drink it just fine. So, you know, changing the focus to how it's used and, and how, the, how the users relate, how, relates to that drug actually changes how you think about whether it should be legal or not or, or what kinds of controls should be in place. So one of the first studies that they funded was for using magic mushrooms and LSD for cluster headaches, and they didn't actually do a, an actual study. What happened was they found out that there was a support group for sufferers of cluster headaches. Has anyone here ever had a cluster headache? I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, get some acid. Uh, <laughs> the pain, I've had a migraine, and I'm told that it is like 10 times, it's like 10 migraines in one. It's just unbelievably painful. And most of the medications that are out there are ineffective after a certain amount of time. So there were people who were just desperate, completely incapacitated by headaches, and um, desperate, and they began self-medicating with hallucinogens, specifically magic mushrooms and LSD. So this particular study, you know, it, it's not perfect. I mean, these were all self-reports, but in fact, a huge fraction of these, these sufferers said that the LSD and the magic mushrooms actually really did alleviate the pain, um, help them in ways that the other medications would not. Whatever action biochemically it's happening in the brain is associated somehow with stopping the onset of the symptoms. And we're not even sure what causes cluster headaches, so we're nowhere near understanding exactly what's going on. But we can't study what's going on because the drug is illegal. So what MAPS was trying to do was do this preliminary self-report study to try and build up evidence in order to one day get permission to study this. And this, this work is still being done. One of the men who did this early work is, uh, he hasn't, he's not dealing hallucinogens, but he's dealing with essentially um, a, a derivative of uh, LSD, and he's working on developing that as a drug for cluster headaches uh, you know, for the market. Um, but definitely we want to know a little bit more what's going on neurologically, what's happening, you know, not only with the cluster headache, but why a hallucinogen might work against it where other medications are not. 
we can't study that, or at least it, it's very difficult because it's just so hard to get approval to get the drug. So I mentioned ayahuasca, the spirit vine. The active ingredient there is uh, DMT. Most of these are tryptamines um, or various relatives thereof. That, that's the psychoactive element that gives you, you know, that feeling of disembodiment and the hallucinations. This is a fascinating thing. It's, there's two elements to it. This is the vine itself, and it's, it's basically crushed up with a bunch of leaves. It's the leaves that can, contain the DMT, not the vine. And they boil it together into this disgusting, really brownish, thick liquid, and then people drink it. Um, it's part of a religious ceremony in certain Brazilian tribes. It is not pleasant. I think that that is an important thing to feature, even though you have this out-of-body hallucinatory visions and all these sorts of things. Um, there's a cost to it. Uh, people are advised to bring their own vomit buckets because you will get sick. Um, th that, that's a side effect to it. Um, but it's very, very powerful stuff, and it's stuff that we don't fully understand. Um, but maybe we should have been looking at it all along, because back in the 1920s, there was this guy named Lewis Lewin who wrote a treatise called Fantastica about hallucinogens. And he didn't look at the psychoactive element. He looked at the vine. And he got a compound out of that called banisterine. And he found that if he took that without the DMT component, without the leaves, that he didn't get the hallucinations. And in fact, he felt that he had improved motor control, and he felt his health, appetite was healthier, and he felt invigorated. And he thought this would be fantastic treatment for Parkinson's. Because think about what Parkinson's does. I mean, you have tremor, you have poor motor control, and you have you know, decreased appetite and things like that. So, unfortunately, he died shortly thereafter, and nobody followed up on this, ever, until like now. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to stick on this slide. There is a, a man named uh, uh, Juan Sanchez Ramos. He goes by Zeno, because he's an artist on the side. And uh, he has a very colorful man. Um, I have a profile of him coming out in Mental Floss in a couple months. Uh, he basically was a Latin playboy who went to Paris and fell in love and dropped acid for the first time. And then rather than becoming an artist and losing himself in a drug culture, he became so fascinated by its effects on the brain that he became a neuroscientist. And uh, <laughs> so he has been involved with maps off and on, but he works specifically on things like Parkinson's and Huntington's, these neurodegenerative disorders. And he found out about, Lewis's, about Lewin's paper and he wrote a review article. And uh, he did his own study. He had to do it in Ecuador with, with, a, with a small group of scientists. MAPS helped kick in some of the funding for that. And they did find that, in fact, Lewin was correct. Preliminary evidence, and it is preliminary, um, shows that it does reduce tremor. It actually does address some of the motor function problems that Parkinson's patients suffer from. Um, there are side effects. Uh, they get sick. <laughs> uh, it, it's, not a, it's not an accident that uh, the ayahuasca ceremonies, people are vomiting all the time. And, uh, you know, they're, they're not sure about the, the uh, they would have to go through all these FDA safety trials. But there's promise there. It bears looking into. And it is still very, very difficult to get funding for this kind of study. So he can't get that. So he turned his attention to a different uh, drug. His work on, the, on the, uh, the ayahuasca put him in touch with a woman named Deborah Mash. Uh, out of Florida, who was working with Ibogaine to treat addiction. Ibogaine is actually a West African shrub. It's kind of a bar mitzvah drug uh, for certain West African tribes where, you know, a young man comes of age and he's basically given this tea of the shrub. It, and this is it in a powdered form. Um, but, uh, and then they send them off into the forest to commune with their ancestors, you know, with, the, with their visions. And they come back and they come back and they're given a new name and a new identity. So it's this coming of age kind of thing. But Ibogaine actually turns out to curb withdrawal symptoms and cravings for opiates in particular. And we know this thanks to a, guy, a heroin addict <laughs> named Howard Lotsoff. This is him in his youth. This is him older. Um, when he was 19 years old, he was basically he was a junkie. He was living in New York City. And he would basically do any drug anyone handed him. And someone one day handed him Ibogaine, and he did it. And he found when he came, to, uh, when he came down that he no longer craved his heroin fix. And not only that, he did not have any withdrawal symptoms. So he started, he got some more Ibogaine, and he gave it to some of his junkie friends and found that it, all, it did the same thing for them, which is not to say they all cleaned up and, and became law-abiding citizens, because you know, anyone who studies addiction knows it's very complicated. There are behaviors, all these various things. But the physical addiction, the physical effects of the heroin addiction were completely curtailed. 
And he is the first one who basically lobbied to get the first studies of Ibogaine done. And Deborah Mash and Ramon Sanchez Ropez, uh, Juan Sanchez Ramos, were the ones that did this study. Unfortunately, it got shut down because there was some evidence at a, by another study that it caused death of neurons in rat brains, and the FDA just said, no, not going to do it. Not to be undaunted, Deborah Mash has opened up a clinic uh, in St. Kitts where it's legal, and uh, she basically treats addicts, and she reports very, very high recovery rates. Not perfect, but very, very high. Again, it's a hallucinogen. It's, it's, it, it's used recreationally by some people and religiously by others, but you know that's just one side of it. And there is this other side, and by making these things schedule one drugs with no, med no medicinal value, we are basically cutting off any kind of advances um, that might help us. Peyote, uh, mescaline. Um, most, a lot of Native American tribes use these in religious ceremonies. It's, it's, it's part of the practice of their religion. They use it to commune with God. Um, but one of the things that uh, scientists started to notice was that in the tribes that practiced this religion, there was almost no alcoholism, like none. Uh, and you know, the, the religion itself, even though they're all taking peyote, the members of the church basically are, just don't drink, they don't do any other drugs. Really, peyote is not a recreational drug for them. It's part of their sacrament. There's a reason for that. John Halpern, who has worked with them, said, you know, peyote really doesn't like alcohol. Um, and, and he said, in fact, you know, he's worked with a lot of um, alcoholics, and he says, alcoholics hate hallucinogens, they hate acid. And because they're trying to run away from things, they're trying to get a predictable effect every time they do something. And as we said, hallucinogens are unpredictable. Hallucinogens are gonna bring forth the things that you're trying to run away from. Alcoholics hate it. <laughs> and uh, Halpern has worked with uh, many of, many of uh, these tribes, and he's found that, you know, he told this wonderful story of this young man who had developed a major drug and alcohol problem and uh, went through a ceremony, and it was a very painful ceremony. He got sick, he was frightened. It, these were not pleasant experiences, but it did, in fact, turn his life around and help him overcome his alcoholism. So the other ones I'm going to talk about, I don't know how much time I have left. I'm going to try and whip through this. How much? Five minutes? I can do this. Um, ecstasy, which we all know, we've seen uh, the, the raves. It's like you, you, you pop that and it's just like, whoa, the world is beautiful. Um, and the other one is magic mushrooms, which I've already mentioned, psilocybin. Both of these, along with LSD, are extremely useful in treating depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress disorder. In fact, many people don't realize that before LSD was outlawed, before it became the flower child's drug of choice, in the 50s, it was used by psychiatrists, particularly in Hollywood. Cary Grant very famously um, underwent therapy. And I, I love that he talked about molecules, too. His quote was, you know, all my life I've been going to run in a fog, and you're just a bunch of molecules till you know who you are. But he also told people that it takes a lot of courage to take the drug. You know, for the same reason that uh, Robin Car Carhart Harris told me, they're not good for escapism. They're going to make you think. So there have been a number of studies that are using this to treat PTSD in particular and um, end of life. Um, a lot of patients who are can you know, terminal cancer patients are having to cope with the fact that their life is going to end. And it can be very anxiety. As one woman put it, death is the ultimate fear. It's our ultimate anxiety. And this is something that can actually help and seems to be helping. So this is essentially someone on magic mushrooms who's been given that. You blindfold, you know, and I, I, when I was doing my acid trip, I found that when I closed my eyes, it was actually just much easier and much nicer. You just kind of go with it a little bit more. I think my, my line was, you gotta close your eyes to really see, man. But, you know, so. <laughs> but then I came down. <laughs> but it really does help, you know, get you enveloped in that sense of losing yourself a little bit. And it's comforting. I felt comforted. I felt like I'm part of something really big and it's okay if something happens to me because this all's still gonna be out there and that's all, that's all good. Um, but I wanna close with the, um, one of the most moving anecdotes. Um, Aldous Huxley, when he died, he died on the day that John F. Kennedy was assassinated. Um, he died of throat cancer, and any of you are familiar uh, with throat cancer, it's a horrible, horrible way to go. And Laura Huxley, his wife, was warned that it was not going to be pretty. There's going to be choking and rattling, and he's going to be, you know, it, it's, it's just awful. And she said, well, what can I do? 
She goes, what if I gave him LSD? Would that help? And the doctor was like, I don't know. There had literally only been two cases where this had been tried, and one it helped, and the other it was inconclusive, so who knows? He just said, it can't hurt, but I'm not going to do it. But then Huxley himself, he couldn't speak, but he wrote down this. This is his note, LSD, try it. Intramuscular is what that actually is. It has been slightly obscured, and gave her the dose. And she herself administered the injection. And then she spent three hours just sitting with him, stroking his head, and talking him through it. And um, you know, it's all—it's so easy, and you're so at peace, and this is not going to hurt at all, and this sort of thing. And he went. The doctors that were there said that they had never seen anyone uh, with that with that particular throat cancer die so peacefully. That there were no convulsions, and it, it was not ugly. And she has this account in a very famous letter. You can Google it online. And this is the quote. Is his way of dying to remain our and only our relief and consolation, or should others also benefit from it? Um, these are drugs that used, it, it's a tool like any other. You can use it irresponsibly, or you can use it to actually ease pain and suffering and do good in the world. But you have to be able to do the studies first. So I had this great quote by John Halpern, you know, that we want to be the anti-Leary, we're serious, we're sober scientists, and that peyote is not a party drug. And of course, you know, my, my take is always, well, can't we have just a little peril? Because <laughs> it was fun, okay? If, if you're the type of person that can handle this, it can actually be a lot of fun. But uh, so, yes, you know, I, I think it bears revisiting that we definitely need to get to the point where we can, we no longer get this, this Schedule One classification where we can actually do research and maybe let people have a little fun now and then. Um, and here it is, the most boring video footage ever. It's going to look like it's not even moving. <laughs> Where'd you go? I'll be right back. I did this for 10 minutes. And the wood, I'm just telling you, the stuff was happening. <laughs> so that's my talk. Um, I'm going to turn the sound down if there's any questions. It's just that for 10 minutes.